I appreciate it, Jeff. Please forgive any uh, kids yelling or dogs barking as I'm doing this from home. But uh, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, like I mentioned, rhinoplasty is my passion. It's um, I've been doing this uh, procedure now for 10 years, uh, plus my residency, so close to 15 years now since 2005. And I've uh, appreciated, like uh, Dr. Epstein just mentioned, um, uh, the same uh, appreciation uh, that I started to develop uh, many years ago has just been fostered because of the complexity of the surgery. Um, I'm always pushing myself, I'm always challenging my, myself to get better and better and better as a surgeon. Um, it's amazing uh, how the procedure has evolved, not only in my hands, but even globally. Um, as I attend and lecture at meetings annually, I've seen the techniques change throughout the years. Uh, although there have been some uh, dramatic giant leaps forward in some of the things that I've been doing in the course of my practice, uh, there are some more subtle refinements and uh, techniques that I've evolved and developed. Um, and I really felt I've been in the best interest of my, uh, my patients. And I'm constantly, particularly now, uh, with, uh, with the downtime and the stoppage of my surgery, uh, constantly educating myself on the latest research, as well as looking back, um, you know, I'm, I'm my own hardest critic, um, as uh, Dr. Epstein, you know, I can attest to as well. Um, I'm, I spend my time looking back on my patients, looking back on my techniques. I take a lot of photography, uh, both in surgery, um, before and after as well, uh, to visually educate myself as to, you know, where uh, refinements can be made and how the technique can be further improved. So I just want to start, uh, that's just a little bit of a background uh, as to where my passion lies. Um, I wanted to uh, start uh, with basically just some basic aesthetics uh, in both the male and female uh, nose um, as I've uh, seen it. So I'm going to try to share my screen here. Um, hopefully this works here. So, so um, what I wanted to start with is basically uh, the female uh, bridge and how it differs from the male bridge and how, uh, you know, we look at it. Um, this is an ethnic rhinoplasty case. Uh, within rhinoplasty, obviously, ethnic rhinoplasty, and I hope you can see this uh, screen. Uh, uh, within rhinoplasty, you know, every uh, patient poses a unique anatomy. Of course, um, I had the fortune of practicing not only in Miami, but I did my training in Chicago. So it's been a very uh, you know, I've seen a lot of patients of multiple ethnicities. I do a lot of uh, ethnic rhinoplasty, a lot of Hispanic cases, uh, patients of Asian descent, um, and um, as well as Caucasian and, his, and, like I mentioned, Hispanic patients. So the female profile aesthetics differ from the male profile aesthetics um, in most patients. And again, Dr. Epstein alluded to uh, communicating uh, mutual goals for surgery, and I'm a firm believer in computerized imaging. Uh, not like Dr. like Dr. Epstein mentioned, not as a sales tool, but rather to openly communicate what the goals are for surgery. So what are uh, the patient's goals for surgery? I show them what I feel could be realistic and aesthetic in their case. And then I use that, uh, that computerized image to further communicate uh, as to what the patient may desire, what they do or they don't like about the surgery uh, or about the proposed outcome. I'm not a fan of necessarily continuing to revise uh, computerized imaging uh, because, um, I, I, like I mentioned, I use it as a means of communication. So it's obviously easier to, to morph a computerized photos. And I always tell patients, you, you know, you're not made of, of patients are not made of clay or wood, uh, unfortunately. So the computerized imaging serves as a basis uh, uh, of how, let's say, they, they perceive their bridge or how they want their bridge to be. Uh, but in general, um, you know, uh, the female uh, aesthetic, you know, has a more of a, a slightly uh, a slope to the bridge. I'm not a fan of, of creating a very sloped, ski sloped bridge, <clears throat> as was uh, popularized with rhinoplasty many years ago, um, which lends itself, especially over time, to give a very unnatural appearance. Uh, but uh, although I, my uh, aesthetic preference is to give a very natural outcome, um, and by doing so, you know, creating a nice, gentle, uh, you know, maybe a straighter to a slightly sloped uh, bridge, as in this case uh, of, uh, of an African-American uh, patient who perceived herself as having a bump. And in this case, uh, which is interesting, um, 
you know, it's not a matter of this patient presents themselves and they come in and they say they want to reduce the bump. But in this case, it's not a matter of necessarily reducing the bump. It is to a degree, but most of it in a case like this, especially in someone with thicker skin, you have to project the tip. Projection meaning push it outwards. And you have to bring down this uh, bump and at the same time elevate the radix a little bit so you get this nice natural curvature uh, to the profile and give it a very natural looking result as, it, as opposed to it looking very uh, ski sloped. Um, another patient, uh, his, uh, female patient, uh, this is her before from the frontal view, uh, came in with the concerns, I'm sorry, I'm having issues with my, came in concerns with her tip from the front, but mostly her concerns were from the profile view. She also wanted a nice uh, natural outcome, a gentle slope. So obviously, not only the bridge has to be refined in her case, but also the tip, because the bridge and tip aesthetics go hand in hand. So in her case, from the, uh, from the front view, you know, we were able to create these refinements to the front of the nose uh, by reshaping the tip so that it, it appears narrower without creating a very pinched look because we don't want to bring this out to a point, but we want to create a nice soft oval shape like I referred to, to the tip aesthetics so that it appears natural, doesn't appear pointed from the front. And then this lends itself to the profile view, similar to the profile that I showed earlier of you know a straighter bridge, a nice gentle slope to the nose, a slight lifting of the tip, but still preserving a very natural uh, appearance. Uh, now, switching to male profile aesthetics. Male profile aesthetics tend to be a little bit more, it's a little different. Uh, uh, this young man came in uh, with the concerns of an overprojected nose, uh, a larger nose, a, a projected tip, a projected bridge as well. Uh, so this is what's referred to as a very complicated case, actually, uh, is referred to uh, as a tension nose. Basically, you have an overgrowth it's under tension, overgrowth of the bone, overgrowth of the cartilage, overgrowth of this cartilage and bone down here. So in his case, we've set back the nose pretty considerably in his case, uh, and then also supported and raised the tip, but at the same time, keeping a very strong profile. Although it's a much smaller nose, uh, we're still able to preserve a very strong, straight profile in him, which is different, like you may notice, from uh, the other two previous patients. And again, I wanted to show another example of a male with a, a large overprojected bridge uh, and nose as well. We're setting back the nose, setting back uh, the tip. Um, and this is a rather uh, involved maneuver that I perform because it's not just a matter of bringing in the nose or what's called deprojecting the nose, but I've actually brought back the nose in, to such a degree that I've uh, created a, more of an acute angle. As you could see, it's subtle, but his upper lip has actually lengthened in this case because of the fact that I was able to bring in the tip and reset the projection of the nose. I actually set back the tip cartilages back onto his uh, bone here so much that his tip was actually able to lengthen and his nose was actually able to uh, relax. Uh, and this is another uh, case, male aesthetics, which are different, like I alluded to, from the, from the aesthetics that I showed earlier. Jeff, do you want to uh, inter intervene or interject at all uh, at any point? Or? No, 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 Tony. You can talk. Go for another okay. 10, 15 minutes. Uh, that's yeah, fine. It's I'm, beautiful yeah, work, I'm, just so. gonna, I'm just going through some examples of Great. some, you know, quote, unquote, cases here, classic cases. This is completely switching gears here. Um, I, I just wanted to... Uh, you know, uh, demonstrate, if you will, uh, you know, the, the various uh, noses uh, that I perform, uh, you know, they're not just all the same, obviously. Everyone's anatomy is completely different based on, uh, you know, their ethnic background uh, and so forth, skin thickness, uh, nasal bone shape. Uh, this uh, patient has the complete opposite problem, right, as a, or as a complete opposite concern uh, than the other patients. Instead of having a large nose, or instead of having an over-projected nose, uh, she felt like she had a very short nose and had no bridge, had no definition. She came to me and said, I'm all tip. I've got no bridge. Uh, and this is a, a patient of uh, Hispanic uh, as well as uh, of African uh, descent. 
Um, and in her case, what we did was we actually, to create refinements to the front of the nose, we actually had to build up the nose, right? Which is the opposite of what I was referring to earlier. Now, now we're not reducing the nose, we're actually building the nose. Uh, so this is the complete opposite end of the, of the spectrum, if you will, as far as uh, the, uh, I'm sorry here. Oh, my screen froze. My screen froze here. Um, Okay. All right. So this is her, uh, you know, changes that we see from the front, uh, you know, able to, you know, reduce, uh, you know, the, some of the, the bulbosity, the thickness to the tip, able to change the configuration of her nostrils a little bit, uh, but mostly building up her bridge. And again, you can see the before and after. This is the opposite, right? We're building, we're actually building up the nose to create these refinements to the front we're actually building up the nose from the profile view. So in her case, I don't use implants in the nose. I actually, in her case, use cartilage from the ear. Uh, it's a technique that I've developed uh, and I've almost, you know, I've really truly fallen in love with it over the last couple of years just because of the results I've been able to get with it uh, using natural cartilage. So I built up her bridge and I projected her bridge to create those refinements in three dimensions that I showed you in the frontal view. Um, Another uh, example, this, these are more complicated cases. These aren't your necessary, your, you know, your, your, your easy rhinoplasties. Not that any of them are easy, but in this case, uh, this patient, her concerns were mostly the profile, but you always have to treat the nose obviously in three dimensions. So the, what you see in the front affects what you see in the side. So in her case, her concerns were of the profile view. She felt like she had a bump. She felt like her tip was droopy. Uh, so we have to look at the frontal view and we have to preserve uh, the natural appearance to the frontal view because it's one thing to just raise this tip and bring it out to a point and bring down this hump. Uh, but in her case, we have to consider the shape of her cartilages. And in her case, what I've done is actually a little bit more of an advanced technique, uh, which is called repositioning of the tip cartilages, where I don't just suture the tip cartilages together to make the tip smaller. I actually flatten them and what's referred to as reposition them, bring them down to change the shape and also create refinements. So, so in her case, you know, to preserve the natural appearance to the tip, to, you know, she's, she wasn't as concerned as creating a narrow tip in her case, but you have to consider this in three dimensions. So what I did in her case was I repositioned her tip cartilages to preserve that natural horizontal oval shape to the tip and now bring it out to a very pinched look, which is very easy to do in this case. It's, you could fall into that trap as a surgeon to pinch this uh, patient's nose. So we have to preserve that soft, as you can see from her tip highlight points here, it's a very, uh, you know, this tip highlight point, this, this white here, uh, it's showing like a, a horizontal uh, shape to the tip. Uh, and it's basically the tip has been shortened. This part of the nose down here called the columella has been brought in uh, to create a smaller quote unquote tip. And then what this did was it translated to the profile view into, you know, the raising of the tip and of course, you know, achieving her goals uh, from uh, the profile. But again, it goes hand in hand, what you do in the side, you have to, you have to uh, think about what you're doing in the front as well. Switching gears a little bit, uh, this is a Hispanic patient um, as opposed to the uh, Caucasian uh, female that we saw earlier uh, or just now. Uh, this is a patient that came in with the primary concern of the wideness, the, what's called the bulbosity of her tip. And again, from the profile, she again was concerned about the bump and the droopy appearance to the tip. So again, in her case, you know, I look at these cases to be very challenging because we want to maximize the refinements to the front of, of this girl's nose, but at the same time preserve a very natural result. So again, this isn't a matter of just bringing in these tip cartilages or suturing or stitching these tip cartilages together or shaving them down because that could lead to a very pinched tip, a very uh, pointy uh, tip, over-resected, what we refer to as overdone look, which looks very operated on. So to achieve her concerns as well, her tip cartilages were repositioned as well. 
So what I was able to do in this case as well uh, was to bring her tip highlight points down here like they are earlier, but re remove this fullness on the outside of the nose to create a very soft, what's called brow tip aesthetic line. So this line here, if you could see my pointer, is referred to as the brow tip aesthetic line. In her case, it, was, it comes down here and then it comes out around the tip. So you wanna preserve this, this really nice soft curvature to the nose so that it comes out to a nice soft oval, horizontal oval shape to the tip of the nose and give it a very natural uh, look. And then how this reflects into the profile view as well to achieve her goals do we bring down the bump? But again, it's not so much as bringing down the bump in her case as it is in refining her tip cartilage to give it a very soft, natural uh, appearance so it doesn't look overdone or, or operated on to give a natural result. And then I'll finish with a couple more cases. These are more complicated, crooked noses, whole other ball game here when you're dealing with crooked noses. Uh, crooked noses are thought to be within rhinoplasty, some of the hardest uh, within primary rhinoplasty. So this young girl, again, has a very crooked nose. As you can see here off to the right, she was born this way. When, when you're born with something, it's called congenital. So she had this congenital deviation to the nose. So to do these cases, I'm very aggressive with these because I've learned, again, through the years, through the last 10, 15 years I've been doing this surgery, that you can't take a minimalist approach with crooked noses because they'll stay crooked. Uh, so to get your, to get the best outcome, I perform a top to bottom uh, reconstruction of the nose. I do asymmetric uh, osteotomies, meaning what I do on the right side on the bones is completely different than what I do on the left side. On this right side, I've actually brought in the bone, and on the left side, I've actually will push out the bone. What I do to the middle third of the nose, which is this part of the nose here, I actually do uh, uh, what are called spreader grafts, which are cartilage grafts, which help to straighten the middle third of the nose. But in addition to that, I perform uh, these clocking sutures, which is basically where I take a stitch from this side and I literally pull a nose over towards the left side. Again, a very aggressive approach, but I found it to be uh, invaluable with crooked noses. And then the last area is the tip. You have to treat the tip completely differently. I've repositioned the tip. The tip is completely independent um, of the middle third of the nose. So you have to treat the tip differently. So in this patient, you know, I've been able to you know, straighten the nose. In her case, uh, by bringing these cartilages over, bringing the tip cartilages over, and at the same time achieving her goals aesthetically which were not only the deviation of the nose, but also to give uh, the tip some more refinement and also narrow and straighten the bridge. And then also from, lastly, from the profile view, again, achieving her concerns by reducing the bump and slightly elevating the tip. Uh, again, not an, not an easy case. And I'll end with a, a male rhinoplasty uh, patient uh, with, with a crooked nose. His was related to a series of uh, trauma, but at the same time, uh, born with some uh, deviation to the nose. He said he had noticed this his entire life, as he said. Um, so his concerns were the deviations of the nose to, towards the left side. Uh, different techniques. I'm not going to belabor what I do with this, but again, you, I take a very aggressive approach to give the patient the benefit of the doubt. I'm not saying I'm perfect in these cases because they're extremely difficult, uh, but nonetheless, to give uh, the patient the benefit of maximizing the straightness to the nose, I'm very aggressive with these procedures. And again, in this case, you know, we were very able to straighten his nose, uh, which was significantly uh, deviated. Uh, and within this is funny, uh, crooked noses started my passion with rhinoplasty because they're so challenging. Um, and through the years, my techniques have uh, refined themselves to try to maximize the results for the patients. So again, I just wanted to show uh, uh, you know, different uh, procedures, uh, different patients of different ethnicities, uh, male, female patients, um, um, uh, you know, as, as a rhinoplasty patient, you know, isn't just obviously done on one specific anatomy. Patients come in with different concerns and different goals, um, and we have to individualize um, our uh, treatment plan for everyone. Thank you. Tony, that was great.
Um, yeah. Every time I see your work, I'm impressed. Those are not easy to achieve, especially with consistency. And I think that it's important to recognize that certain steps, extra steps need to be taken to co have consistency in rhinoplasty because every surgeon can have, you know, a handful of cases that are, you know, come out nice, but to have all those different cases and to consistently produce the kind of results. Any thoughts about that, Tony, in terms of, you know, how do you, what are particular steps that you feel are necessary to have reliable results? Um, I've been, it's funny because I've been thinking about a lot of that uh, now um, in the circumstances that we find ourselves in. Um, what I, like I alluded to earlier, um, I am a constant student of this surgery and a constant student of my own results. Uh, as you know, I, I take a lot of uh, photos. I take a, a detailed diagram of everything that I do in surgery uh, for my own uh, knowledge for my own edification. So uh, what I have found and to be very helpful for me is, okay, what have I done in this specific case and how has it turned out six, nine, 12 months after the surgery? Uh, and given the, you know, now, you know, hundreds and not a thousand cases that I've done already, um, I found that being so self-critical uh, and analyzing my surgical techniques has really what's um, I found to have developed more consistency in my results using that approach. Tony, would you describe rhinoplasty as more aesthetic or technical? Or what balance? How does it fit in, and how does that compare to other plastic surgery procedures, facial plastic? Yeah, procedures? I think obviously, you know, it's it's obviously a bit of both. Um, I think that um, I think aesthetically um, um, it's uh, open, you know, uh, communication um, as far as I mean, uh, we all have aesthetic um, goals if we have concerns, obviously, about our noses. Um, so the element of uh, the artistic component of it um, goes so far, um, then you have to be very technical. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, because uh, the artistic component, you know, allows you to develop a picture in your mind. And that's why I love computerized imaging. And it's been a beautiful tool um, that's been um, developed um, because it allows you to convey to the patient what's going on in your mind as far as what we could artistically achieve. But then it just your dexterity and your technical ability takes over. Um, it's, uh, it's a very, very uh, technical, very complex uh, um, as far as dexterity um, and ability uh, uh, surgically ability so it's I think it's if I had to give it a percentage Jeff I would probably say 30 percent artistic and 70 percent um, uh, technical when you started working with me eight years ago um, these cases used to take you quite a bit longer and you're obviously more efficient yet I think obviously you're happier with yeah. the results today than you were like we all are how yeah. would you explain that it's different. Um, I wouldn't say, um, and I've had this conversation with a lot of surgeons, rhinoplasty surgeons, who are, you know, with uh, a lot of experience, a lot more experience than myself. Um, where I spend my time in surgery is different. So I wouldn't say that necessarily my, uh, my surgical times have gone down. I mean, I, like I tell patients, I'm in there to give you the best possible result. My goal is to give you the best possible result that I humanly can uh, given your anatomy and given my ability right in that surgery so obviously eight years ago nine ten years ago where i spent my time in surgery was probably uh more in the actual uh technical aspects of the procedure whereas now i spend a lot more time in the minutia mm -hmm. because i've noticed through the years that to go from like the book says from good to great You've got to focus on the minutia. So I, I spend a lot of time using, uh, like you know, soft tissue graphs, which I uh, take from the nose. And what that does is just helps me to camouflage any potential uh, irregularities or um, asymmetries, which could come up in any surgery in the future. Not to say that we can obviate, but uh, those asymmetries or irregularities but we can take more measures to camouflage that. Um, and it's funny because I did notice that 
you know, looking back on my residency and my fellowship 10 years ago, um, like you, like you alluded to my mentor, my, my mentor, rhinoplasty, he would spend an hour of the surgery on these like subtle details that, you know, 11 years ago, I wasn't seeing, but now I see them. And now I know why he spent the time in those subtle uh, details of the procedure. Because yeah, I mean, you, there's a difference between a good rhinoplasty and great rhinoplasty with consistent results. Interesting. When you talk about the fine details, would you talk about one of the questions we got asked is how do you deal with thick skin, particularly in patients of African ethnicity? I know we both talk about this in different approaches, not just the steroid injections afterwards, but defatting of the skin. What are some of the other things that you, that you feel you need to do with, uh, to deal with thicker skin? The way I explain it to patients um, that have thicker skin is it's like a thick blanket. So um, ironically or counterintuitively, I guess I should say, sometimes we need to build up the nose to create more refinements in the sense that we have to look at the nose in three dimensions. So when we have a thicker covering, when we have thicker skin, we can't reduce the bones and reduce the cartilages and expect the nose to appear thinner because that just creates thicker skin. So you're basically bringing down the support underneath that thicker covering. So in patients of thicker skin, yes, you can defat the skin and that helps to an extent, but you have to create and you have to have adequate support of the bones, of the bridge, and of the tip. If you don't have that support uh, from the perspective of the profile, um, you won't develop the refinements that you're seeking from the frontal view. I like to analogize it to a tent. A tent. Yeah. If you have a tent, you think, think of the skin as the canvas and the tent is the hip cartilages or basically all the cartilages. And if you have a tent pole that's all the way suspended, you're gonna have a nice defined pointy tip, relatively speaking. If you let that tent pole slide back down, the canvas is just going to bunch around. So it's the same concept. You can cut away all the inside material, but actually many times, as you said, as you used the term counterintuitive, you actually want to increase tip projection a bit and increase the strength, which may require adding cartilage. Doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be fatter. It's just that you're having better support and therefore that, that underlying, that overlying skin can lay nicer. Would you sort of agree with that analogy? No, exactly. I, I use that analogy a lot as well. I, I, I use the analogy of a thick blanket. So the more you push into that blanket, if you were to stick your hand underneath a thicker blanket, um, obviously, if, you're, if your hand's down on the base of the, of the bed, you're not going to see your hand. But as you project into that, you're going to see more of the underlying structure. And that's what you need to do uh, with thick skin patients. Great. Let me present a couple of cases as well, but I'm... Um, I hope I'm, uh, oh, let me see, where is my presentation? Sorry about that. Uh, yeah, it's right there. Sorry about that. I'm going to share. Hmm. I'm hitting share screen. Oh, Tony, did you, are you still sharing or no? Huh, I'm no, so I'm sorry. Not. For some reason, why don't you talk for a couple of minutes, Tony? I'm gonna try to figure this out. Yeah, there were some questions um, that I see pop up on my screen of uh, uh, crooked noses, um, and that being the most difficult of all, you know, um, frankly, of all primary cases. Um, you know, revisions is another, is another beast, if you will. But uh, crooked noses, uh, again, a lot of them um, are due to one of two things. So the, my first assessment on, on history taking is whether the crooked nose is due to trauma or uh, congenital, like I mentioned, meaning that you were born with it. Um, we're all born with a degree of asymmetries um, to our noses. Um, now, um, some more than others, obviously some are born with some natural deviations. We don't know why, uh, but just some patients have a naturally deviated nose. Those are more challenging uh, than noses that were uh, crooked because of trauma. It's working, Jeff. Um, so when I tell, when I see patients, and I do a lot of congenitally crooked noses, um, basically we're reversing something that was, you know, naturally given. 
Um, so those require uh, a lot more of an aggressive uh, approach uh, than we would if somebody, uh, whether their um, the deviation was related to trauma, uh, such as you know sports-related injury or so forth. Jeff, it's working. Great. If it's all right, let me just talk about. Yep. I'm just going to show a couple of cases as well. Um, another typically ethnic type nose, some of the classic features or lack of definition of the tip. In this case, the patient has a orbiprojected dorsum or bump. Uh, when she smiles, her tip droops a bit due to soft support or inadequate support of the tip cartilages. This was her after by rotating the tip up but increasing slightly its projection, taking down its bump and creating a more refined look. So you can see the before and the after. The tip is a bit projected, but this is the sort of the only way to maintain that projection uh, when she smiles so it doesn't droop anymore. And so basically what we did was, what I did was basically rebuild the tip uh, through an open approach to create better support. Here's another similar type nose, but thinner skin, a slight bump. In this case, the tip was not downwardly rotated, but she had pretty good projection, but she was mainly concerned about the asymmetry as well as the lack of definition. And you can see the before and the after on profile. So the tip is actually built up a bit. To, this is sort of my signature. I like to have a super tip break. And you can see the before and the after from front of you. Her nose is straighter. And now you can see much more clearly a tip defining point, which is not actually a point, but it's actually a, a, a little zone of where the tip is. Another case of a patient before, I just showing her before and after. Um, she had a little bit of a little bit of a once again a bump. T uh, the uh, the nasal labial angle, the angle which the cayumella makes with the upper lip, I rotated up, particularly on the distal tip. I opened it up to create a little bit of an upward tip. In this case, this patient also got a chin implant, um, a small chin implant. I feel that there is a role for that. However, chin implants are not in and of itself uh, a uh, replacement for making the nose look prettier, but they can create a slightly nicer aesthetic uh, appearance. And you can see her before and after. She had a cleft cayumella. She was asymmetric. And here the tip is more diamond shaped as opposed to more circular. This is a revision case. Uh, patient had an orbiresection uh, of, uh, of tip cartilages when I opened her up. There was very little of her own natural cartilage left. So in this case, I had to use her ear cartilage to basically rebuild this whole left tip. And you can see the results that I was able to achieve also reset the bridge to help make it a straighter look. And you can see her profile before very little tip support. These tips cartilage were basically free hanging and here the tip's been secured using in this case ear cartilage. There should be no deformity of the ear when we do use ear cartilage. The reason why the ear cartilage had to be used is because so much of her septal cartilage had already been resected with her first surgery. Personally, when I see a patient that had a prior rhinoplasty with their, with, that they're seeking to have repaired, when that prior rhinoplasty was done by a general plastic surgeon, I'm much happier or much more optimistic than it went, if it was done by a facial plastic surgeon, because facial plastic surgeons with a background in ear, nose, and throat generally use, ear, use septal cartilage, uh, may not have been used properly, but they tend to use septal cartilage as opposed to general plastic surgeons many times don't like to go into the septum. If they'll use any cartilage, they'll go ahead and they will use cartilage from the ear. And I prefer septal cartilage, so having that available is always, is always preferable. Here's another patient, a gentleman, somewhat thick skin, a lack of definition of his tip when he smiles, his tip droops, chiomel is asymmetric. You're not going to prevent the nostrils from completely flaring, but when you have better tip support, the tip will be less likely to get pulled back, so therefore the nostrils will tend not to widen as much. And here you can see the, after, the before and the after. I did increase his tip projection a bit, but also a much stronger tip. I didn't have to do any takedown of his bump other than a little bit up here and a little bit here, but mainly this is due to the increase in tip projection, creating a, a nicer looking nose not necessarily a smaller nose, but a nicer looking nose. This is a lecture I gave on Afro-Caribbean patients. It was done in Germany, in Munich, Germany. Um, I talk about with the platyrrhine of the, of the African, typical Afro-Caribbean nose, which is primarily weak tip support, with poor tip projection, thick skin. And you can see before one month and four months after how the nose has become more refined with healing, the skin will thin out. In addition, 
doing uh, injections of steroids will facilitate that. This is a girl before and after. Some, some of the features you presented, Tony, where the nose was actually quite short, I was able to not just lengthen or increase the height of the nose, but also I was able to build up her nose, her bridge. Uh, primarily, I built up her tip, but I did do some building up of the dorsum as well. And you can see the before and the after, and you can see the, the base view the before and the after, how it's much more, instead of this being, the nostrils being uh, round, they're much more um, oblong in, sh in, in shape. And here's one last case of before and an after of a refinement. I did some nostril narrowing, but also built up the tip cartilages, reset the bridge, and you can see even when she smiles, the nostrils don't flare as much. So that's what I have with regards to um, some of these cases with, um, with both um, some of my and some of my cases that I'd like to present. I do have a couple of questions, and one of the questions, the use of Gore-Tex implants. Um, when, is, when should it be used? Um, I use my Gore-Tex. I'm a bigger fan of Gore-Tex preformed nasal implants. I like to use it for building up the dorsum. It is permanent. Gore-Tex has been used for, I've been personally using Gore-Tex for over 27 years in the nose. Um, it's 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 basically inert, which means the body does not recognize it as anything other than itself. Um, it feels natural, particularly these preformed implants can create a nice building up of the dorsum. Your thoughts, your thoughts, Tony? Um, yeah, you know, obviously I differ a little bit. Um, I, I try to use a natural uh, cartilage in the nose. Um, I think, um, um, I, I, I find that aesthetically um, I can achieve um, the same uh, results uh, with having, you know, used both in the past. It's not like I, I don't exclusively use um, natural cartilage. I've, I've definitely done a few cases through the years on patients that have uh, requested or have been adamant about using an implant in the nose, and I have used those in the past. So I'm familiar with the two uh, aesthetically uh, since I haven't found the difference uh, for me and my hands. Uh, my preference is to use uh, natural cartilage. Now that has evolved through the years. Uh, what I was doing uh, 11, 10 years ago is definitely not what I'm doing now. I've evolved from what was a solid implant. Uh, I, would, I used to use uh, rib, uh, referred to as costal cartilage, as a solid implant in the nose. Uh, and that's initially how I was trained to do it. Um, and it, I didn't, I never, um, I was having um, um, concerns with it um, in the way it appeared to patients, especially over time. Um, in fact, no one really, uh, you know, complained to me, although I could see it where the edges were starting to be a little bit more visible through the years. So I switched then to uh, dice cartilage, as you know. Uh, my, my technique with dice cartilage has evolved as well. Um, you mentioned uh, the meeting that we attended in uh, Germany that we spoke at. Uh, I actually, a few years ago, attended uh, the meeting uh, with Dr. Epstein and we went to an international meeting in Germany. Uh, and I switched at that point from using uh, dice cartilage wrapped in what's called temporalis fascia, which is the fascia uh, that we have here on the side of our head. Uh, and I switched from that to using uh, a sealant, uh, which is a, a natural fibrin. Um, and I've been using that instead. Uh, and I've been able to mold the grafts better to make them uh, look uh, like a dorsal bridge. So the results have been extremely natural. It's one less incision for the patient. So it's a little less morbid for the patient. Um, and um, I've been having aesthetically some really nice results with it. And again, you know, my thoughts are, it's not, you know, an implant, so it obviates any potential uh, risk associated with that. Very cool. Um, Tony, do you discriminate? Here's a question. Actually, let me ask, do you discriminate pure crooked noses versus deviated noses on an asymmetric mid face? How do you discriminate pure crooked noses versus deviated noses on an asymmetric um, There's two things. Um, number one, um, uh, that's a great question. Uh, the analysis of a crooked nose uh, entails not only the nose, but 
facial symmetry. Um, and we all have, like I mentioned, um, they've done actually split face analysis on people. Um, it's actually pretty fun um, if you haven't done it on yourself, but if you were to actually take your face um, and then just mirror image one side of your face to the other, you wouldn't look like yourself. So the reason, um, the fact facial harmony and facial beauty comes from subtle asymmetries that we all have. So I look at the face holistically uh, and I analyze all my photos. Uh, I, I take a, a, a frontal view photo uh, that I take in front of my photo board. And then I actually uh, uh, bifurcate the face uh, by measuring the interpupillary distance. I do this for every single case that I perform. It's just a habit I've gotten into. And what I do is then I drop a line uh, in between that point uh, and that helps me to see uh, what a lot of uh, patients so don't see in themselves, which is what's causing the crookedness to the nose. So from that, we break the nose down into the nasal bones, like I mentioned earlier, the middle third of the nose, which is called the middle vault and the nasal tip. And I look at those, not only thirds, you know, upper third, middle third, and lower third, and how that's contributing to the crookedness of the deviation, but rather left and right. So what's, cre what's causing these asymmetries? And by looking at it, uh, do doing that exercise pretty much with every case and particularly with crooked noses, it really helps you to diagnose the cause of the deviation or the cause of the crookedness. Uh, and again, just like in any aspect of, of healthcare and medicine, you start with a diagnosis. And starting with the proper diagnosis of a crooked nose uh, allows for more success rate with correction of the deviation. Got another question for you. Uh, someone said, by the way, amazing work, Tony. Does computer okay. imaging show potential rhino results three months post op one year post? What do you advise? Good question. I, in fact, when I uh, reply, I always reply to computer imaging. Uh, I never do it in person. Uh, what I do is I dedicate the time during the consultation along with my patient coordinator to taking a, a proper history, performing a physical examination, and of course, communicating our goals. Uh, I then take the photos all myself from multiple angles. Uh, then I perform the computer imaging separately. After the consultation, I take the time uh, at the end of each day uh, to go back, review the photos, analyze the photos, and perform the computerized imaging. When I send out the imaging, I email patients the digital images, and I always say, uh, in that email that these results are after the swelling has mostly subsided. So what that means is that the results are not the results you would come to expect one, three months, six months down the road, but what I feel would be the aesthetic and realistic results, nine, 12, and in some cases, especially in patients of thicker skin, that could be a year and a half to even up to two years after the procedure, depending on the healing of the person. So it is after the swelling has mostly resolved. Great. Got another one. I jumped on late, so I'm sorry if this was already addressed. It wasn't. Are tips of the nose the hardest to correct? Pointy or rather long nose tips, ways to go about correcting it. I'm going to jump on this one, yeah. so to speak. Um, tips are... I mean, there's no easy part of our nose to cons get consistent results. In general, achieving naturalness in the tip and the, the aesthetic look is probably the area we focus more of our time. It's, um, so it is, I would say, a bit more, the, I say it's probably that, making a crooked nose perfectly straight and creating a really natural looking symmetric tip are the, probably the two biggest challenges. When tips that you describe point to your rather long tips or over projected, it's many times it's easier actually to de-project a tip than to increase the projection. Um, and there are several ways to do that, um, but it's not what, you don't just cut the cartilage away, we actually shape them, uh, deep, move them, slide them along. So for example, there, what's, what is the tip? These, what's called the calumella, where the tip cartilages come together, we can increase their, how far out they stick back or set them back. Any thoughts you wanna add, add, ask, uh, add to that, Tony, regarding tips and pointy tips and the challenges there. Yeah, um, I'll show, um, let me see, well, give me a second here, I'm gonna. Um, yeah, I, I, I do think uh, uh, tips are the hardest um, part of the nose because um, 
it's the I think a part of the nose where we deal uh, the although the, obviously we deal with it in the entire nose, but we do deal with it um, the three dimensionality of the nose is particularly evident in the tip. So it's very easy. Um, I'm hoping I'm able to share my screen. I think that's showing. Yeah. So I just I just grab this patient real fast uh, as you were uh, uh, talking, Jeff, because I think it draws on this example. Uh, this is a, a revision of a patient with an overprojected pointy nose. Uh, so in, in her case, you know, she was dissatisfied with the length of the nose, the pointiness of the nose. And the reason this happened um, in the primary surgery was because the focus is on the front of the nose, uh, meaning that she went in and she asked that her nose, you know, appears less wide, appears less pointy, appears less bulbous from the front. So of course, to do that, you create refinement, and like we alluded to, and oftentimes you you project uh, the the tip to create these refinements. But so what happened in her case? That yeah, she got a very narrow nose, she got a very pointy tip. Um, you know, there, I mean, I'm not even going to go into the the middle vault and the middle third of the nose. But yeah, she was able to achieve these refinements and these uh, significant narrowing. Uh, I don't have her obviously her original photos, but she was able to create these refinements to the front, but the problem is it was brought out to a point. So that's why I tend to perform a lot of what's called repositioning uh, uh, in these in cases such as hers, because it allows me to deconstruct the tip in three dimensions and to create refinements without necessarily uh, changing uh, the angle of the side nose, uh, the side of the nose. So in her case, I've actually, you know, soften the tip I actually you know widen the tip if you will uh, just to create a more of a horizontal oval aesthetic as I alluded to earlier instead of it coming out to a, a solid point like she had in her primary it comes out to more of a, uh, a horizontal oval you know soft football shape uh, to allow a more natural look still she has a very thin tip you know I feel like she has a very refined tip she was uh, really happy with this tip aesthetic but what it allowed me to do was to set back the tip so it appears softer from the profile, elevated, shorter, and less pointy. Okay. Great. Thank you. Great, great example. Um, I think that's all we have. Oh, we got one more message. Well, this will be our last question. What type of sutures do you use for the tip sculpting dorsal reconstruction? <laughs> You're, I'll let you take it away, Tony. Um, this is something, again, that has evolved um, for tip sculpting. Um, I, you know, I, uh, I don't have a diagram for you to, to show um, of, of, of what I do, and I'm not going to um, you know, um, I'll spare you guys from showing um, intraoperative anatomy, but uh, basically what I do with this tip suturing technique is I do not bring the tips to a point. Um, it's very simple uh, to bring the tip cartilages, and this is what's done in, in, a lot of, in, in, in a lot of rhinoplasty, is, you know, these are your tip points. So what do you do? You bring them together and you bring them down to a point to create re these refinements, if you will, okay, to create narrowing. Uh, instead of doing that, I actually uh, perform a, a suturing technique, which I like to refer to as uh, repositioning of the orientation of the tip, as opposed to uh, uh, significant uh, narrowing of the tip point uh, feature. So um, I use, what are called uh, intradomal uh, sutures, uh, if, if you want a specifics, which means that I individualize sutures. I don't put a suture from one tip cartilage into the other tip cartilage. I separate the tip uh, sutures uh, and I reorient the tip uh, cartilages using these types of sutures. I hope that answered your question. Great. Well, perfect timing, one hour. I like to keep them this way. Um, Tony, I love talking Thank with you. you. I just thought yeah. you was thinking, wouldn't it be cool to have these sort of discussions yeah, on a regular often. basis? What? Yeah, we, yeah. <sighs> Sorry about that. As my dog barks. Um, yeah, as, I would love to do these more often. Yeah.
So please, if you have any questions, um, right now, obviously, we're not doing surgeries, um, but uh, we are doing webcams, webinars, rather, webcams, rather, for, for and also photo reviews. Uh, and, um, but please, if you ever have questions, please feel free to email us. Uh, Dr. Bread's website is dranthonybred, dranthonybred.com. Um, and uh, you're always welcome to call the office for an appointment. Anything else you want to say, Tony, besides I'm going to tell you, thank you so much for- No, thank uh, you. Thank you for your, uh, for your time, for everyone listening. I appreciate it. All right. Have a good right. evening. Stay safe and healthy, everyone. Hey, how are you, Constantine? Nice to see you. Okay, bye, guys. Good night.